Hey, this is Tom Ryan. I am the writer, director, and the founder of Theater of Terror, and you're listening to the Horror Squad Podcast. Hello, welcome back to the Horror Squad Podcast, episode number 267. Tonight, we're talking about 1997's Cube. I'm one of your meatballs, Todd. We have meatball Steve. We have meatball Joe. Men, how are we? Oh, and we have an interview with Steve. We'll cover. I'm doing good. Uh, yes, we do have an interview attached to this episode. I interviewed Tom Ryan, who is the director of Return to the Theater of Terror, which is coming out this spring. But you could watch the first one, Theater of Terror, right now on Tubi. Very good interview. He had a lot of great insight. One question in particular that I really liked his answer to is advice for indie filmmakers. Uh, he actually went into a whole thing and it was very interesting and something I think if you have any interest in ever filming uh, an indie film to listen to what he has to say, because I think what he has to say is very good and important. So great interview. So check it out. It's right at the end of this episode. Yeah. Cool. Hello. <laughs> What's up, hi, people? Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> oh, I have, I have a shout out. I have a shout out, actually. Oh, shout out. I forgot to say it last time, but uh, shout out to our listeners in Saudi Arabia. We charted, I think, number three or five is as high as we got in your iTunes chart recently, and we're still on there. So thank you for listening. And if you have any suggestions for Saudi Arabian horror, email us, com. message us, whatever you got to do. But thank you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. And I'd like to say I'm going to be at Monster Mania coming up next week, March 10th through the 12th, I believe it is. So if anyone, any listeners or anything is going to be at Monster Mania, feel free to shoot us a message and maybe we can meet up, say hey, and yeah, be a good time. Oh, <laughs> um, sorry. That, that was my room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, I recognize the sound. <laughs> so Joe, how many people are you actually meeting at this thing? Because it seems every time you talk to me, you're meeting someone else or you have a new item for someone else. So how many celebrities are you actually trying to get autographs for this show? Great question. I I don't have like a set plan right now, but there's quite a few. I'm definitely meeting The Undertaker. I'm on the fence about actually getting his autograph. He's pricey, bro. He is very pricey. Yeah. I That's why I'm on the fence about actually getting his autograph. I did get a photo op with him which I am going to dress up as uh, Paul Bearer. I got the, the costume ready for that. So in the white face makeup and stuff. So that'll be a good photo. Uh, I'll pro- I'll post that maybe in our Instagram stories and on our Discord, of course, once I take that photo. But yeah, he's, I mean, his photo op is 200 bucks and his autograph is $200. So if I wanted an autograph and a photo, that's 400 bucks right there, which is more than I think I've paid for pretty much any celebrity. I mean, maybe I've gotten to that point with England, but... Yeah, I don't even think I've gotten that high with England because England's like 120 now and I think his photo ops 160. So yeah, it would definitely be the highest. So I think I'm probably going to pass on the autograph for The Undertaker. And I know his line is going to be massive and I don't really want to waste the full day waiting for him because he's on Friday only at the con. I mean, the big, big draw is going to be Sons of Anarchy, which I don't really have no interest in. So I'm hoping the lines are going to be mainly for those guys. The, what's his name? Jax, I think, is the main character. He's going to be there. And I saw his. he's got like fucking like seven of his photo ops have like already sold out. So I know he's going to be a super busy guy. As far as anyone else, well, I'm definitely going to be meeting Terrifier cast, uh, David Howard Thornton, the pale girl. Unfortunately, uh, Lauren Lavera canceled. But she's going to be a Frightmare, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm probably going to get them out of the way so I don't have to worry about them at Frightmare. I think I'm definitely going to do Brooke Smith, who's the girl in the well from uh, Silence of the Lambs. So I'm, I might add her. She's also doing an In the Well photo op, which Your I'm impression. definitely going to get. <laughs> yeah, I should. I should. I'll, maybe I will do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm definitely doing Rebecca Gayhart just because you guys are such urban legend haters. Mm-hmm. I found last night I did some searching on eBay and I did find a custom figure of her as the uh, the killer. So I'm gonna add that. And I think oh, and Quinn Lord, I gotta add Quinn Lord to my poster I got going. I'm trying to get as many horror icons and celebrities on that as I can. So uh, I gotta add him to that. And I think that is about. It. So roughly seven to 10 people, probably. So it will be a bit of an expensive con. It definitely won't be nearly as expensive as Texas Frightmare, though, um, for sure. But 
yeah, Tex Frightmare, I'm going to be cosplaying too as McCready. So I already got the costume getting together that. So I'm doing the thing photo op with the whole cast. So I'm going to dress as McCready for the photo op. So that'll be fun. I can't wait to see your Paul Bear uh, picture with yeah. the Undertaker. It's going to be awesome. And they yeah. have an urn there, I think, uh, in the photo op. They so. do. I wish I knew that because I bought an urn okay. on Amazon for for like you're, 40 bucks. You're going to save and, it for later. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, right. <laughs> well, I was like, well, since I bought it, I was like, maybe I should just get an Undertaker to autograph it because otherwise, like, it'll be completely useless. But an urn is scapes spooky enough, I guess. So I can just keep it in my collection and keep it next to the photo or something. Uh, I guess I got lucky uh, when I uh, got the Undertaker's autograph. It cost me zero dollars because in 1996, celebrities did not charge for autographs. They just essentially were promoting whatever business they were there for. Uh, in my case, it was like um, a record store. So uh, good times when those autographs were, you know, no no money at all. And I also want to give a shout out, and that is to our listeners, because we had our movie club this past Friday. Uh, where we watched a movie called Horror Hotel, the movie. It was, <laughs> even in a group setting, it was a rough, rough watch. You know, someone picked it. I'm not going to say who. It wasn't Marla. I can 100% guarantee you that. But yeah, it was it was a fun night, though. We have a lot of fun in those. And if you like to join in on that kind of fun, it's every last Friday of the month. And all you have to do is join our Discord, which is absolutely free. Just ask us for the link. You can join us in those, a bunch of conversations that we're having. It's, it's a quite a group in there and a lot of fun. So thank you, everyone, for coming out. Awesome. Awesome. All right. You guys ready to get into some horror news this yes. week? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Before we do that, I just had an idea, a thought. Steve bringing up Undertaker being a free autograph. Can you guys like think back to the last time you got like a free autograph from a celebrity? Yes. Like Triple I H comes to my mind, but I that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> so I, I got a lot of wrestlers for free back in the day. But the latest was, oh, what's his name? It's the guy who created the Ninja Turtles. I, I, this name escapes me right now. Kevin Eastman? Kevin Splinter? Eastman. Kevin oh, Eastman. No, Ke yeah. That was Splinter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin Eastman, he he signs for free, uh, at least for the first item. He, he charges if you have a second one. And because of that, at the con I was at, they kicked him out of the autograph place and put him in the like comics where all the kind of vendors are you know and he's like i don't give a fuck and he'd go there he like drew a little ninja turtle for me he signed I, I bought like a thing on his table because i didn't have anything for me and when i met him i actually asked him about it because you know nobody no doesn't charge anymore he's like are you kidding me people have been supporting me for the last 40 years you think i'm gonna charge for my autograph it makes absolutely no sense i'm here to thank you you're not here to thank me so i really like that attitude but other than that outside of like way back in the early 2000s and 90s no uh, that's the last time mm -hmm. yeah i had i got the whole the whole cast of 2001 maniacs when that movie came out for free including lynn shea they it was a 2000 like four ish week in the horror fangoria convention in la and um you watched the panel and then they took them off stage behind it and you got on a line and you got eight by tens and six for free so it's Giuseppe andrews one of the other girls one of the dudes i don't remember them and then lynn shea so pretty pretty sick awesome Giuseppe andrews is probably pretty rare he like his like yeah, disappeared he, he, off the yeah. face of the earth i think so hard times yeah, i think yeah maybe hopefully not a couple actually just came to my mind while we were just talking about that um but shout out Two indie filmmakers, Uncle Lloyd, Lloyd Kaufman, signs absolutely for free at every convention he's at. And also Charles Band from Full Moon also signs completely for free. He's at every single Texas Frightmare weekend too, Charles Band is. And Uncle Lloyd does quite a few cons. So if you see either one of them, you absolutely can go up with at really anything. Like if you buy something, obviously off their table, they'll sign for free. But even if like I bought a uh, toxic avenger poster from like a different vendor and i brought it over um for lloyd to sign and he signed it like no problem so both those guys really awesome and then one i just thought of recently i got jimmy lee curtis for free actually because i waited like outside for like an hour and a half for her to come out and was one of those like weird autograph stalkers <laughs> but i but i got her and it was really cool so i guess if you do it that way you, you can do it but it god it's a lot of fucking effort to do it but you know for someone like her it was totally worth it 
All right, so let's get into horror news. All right, biggest news probably that came out this week is Welcome to Derry. Now, it has been rumored for a long time that this series was going to get greenlit, and now it has officially been greenlit by HBO with a direct-to-series order, so it is definitely going to be coming. Uh, The series will begin in the 1960s in the time leading up to the events of It Chapter 1, which, of course, is based on the 2017 film. Andy and Barbara Muschietti, of course, who directed and produced the original two movies, um, will be on board as series sort of, I guess, uh, advisors. You know, they're not going to be directing this or anything like that, but they're definitely going to be putting the money into it and putting their thoughts and ideas into this. Nothing as far as heavily, heavily rumored that Bill Skarsgård is going to be returning to portray Pennywise. So, yeah, I don't know what you guys think. You guys excited for this one? Yeah, I'm in. I mean, I hope Bill does it. I mean, I don't see any other option, to be honest. It's not like he's, like, doing a bunch of shit, is he? I mean, no fault to him, but, like, he's not in, like, Avatar 2 or anything, you know what I mean? (laughs) I don't know he's got plenty okay. of other scars guards to, uh, <laughs> you know, to take his place while he's doing it. Uh, I'm excited for it. You know, I, I like the it movies. I, I think he's great as Pennywise, and I think it'll be cool to see him uh, reprise that role. So, I mean, all right, awesome. All right, next bit of news here, and I'm sure something that you guys have probably talked about or are going to talk about over on your other podcast, Less XP Geek and Gaming Podcast, and that is the announcement that Blumhouse is getting into the gaming industry as they have officially announced Blumhouse Gaming. Uh, It is going to be, uh, of course, a new subsidiary to, of course, the original movie company where they are planning on publishing horror-themed video games. Perhaps you guys have more info on this than I do, but have you guys heard about this? Are you guys excited about it? I heard about it. I guess they didn't have enough, like, 4v1 horror games out there, and they decided to... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> flood that market even more with every fucking horror property they can yeah, yeah. there's not much detail about it so it's tough to say but i'm always in for more horror games i really really fucking hope they don't do more like multiplayer horror games i'd like to see a single player horror game with the big franchises i think that would be the best case scenario so let's hope they give us that yeah you can do it like the alien game where the xenomorph is like yeah, isolation never ending yeah isolation never ending force and i can totally see that like you have tasks to do and my michael myers chasing after you something but yeah these 4v1s man like oh my gosh it, it was super fun when we played friday the 13th as a group like hands down awesome experience but ugh. all right well we shall see next bit of news steven spielberg making his return to horror question marks well recently Spielberg accepted an award for his movie, of course, The Fablemans, which is getting a lot of Oscar buzz and whatnot. And during his acceptance speech, uh, here is what he said. I feel a little alarmed to be told I've lived a lifetime because I'm not finished. I want to keep working. He said, I want to keep learning and discovering and scaring the shit out of myself and sometimes the shit out of you. I got to get back to some of those earlier scarier movies, but that's another story for later on. As long as there's joy in it for me and as long as my audience can find joy and other human values in my films, I'm reluctant to say that's ever a wrap. So I think that's pretty intriguing quote from him. Obviously, we're speculating here, but the fact that he kind of threw out his earlier scarier works a la, you know, Jaws, of course, and and Gremlins, Arachnophobia, Twilight Zone, the movie, among others. I I, I mean, what do you think? I mean, do you think there's weight to that? Or do you think he's just kind of spitting it out there? I don't know. He might be blowing smoke, but maybe we'll get like a Jaws, The Revenge, The Return. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, he's one of the greatest film workers of all time, right? So yeah, dude, let's do it. Just like when like Tarantino always like teases, like, I'm going to do a Star Trek or I'm going to do a horror movie. Like, let's Yes, let's do it. So, yeah. I mean, of course, Steven Spielberg is one of the greatest directors of all time. So why wouldn't you want him to make a horror movie? You know, he's made some amazing ones. Surprisingly, people don't associate him with horror at all, even though he made, you know, like you guys said, Jurassic Park, which is always uh, up for debate whether or not it's a horror movie. So I'd be totally down for that. Alan. All right, well, follow this next one under Does Anyone Care? Maybe Steve. I don't know. We'll see. But production is officially underway 
for Walking Dead Universe's new series featuring uh, Andrew Lincoln and Denai Guerra, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but Rick, uh, the Rick and Michonne love story. Uh, this is going to be a six-episode series that is set to debut next year on AMC. The series presents an epic love story of two characters changed by a change world, kept, kept apart by distance by an unstoppable power by the ghosts of who they were. How beautiful. Uh, Steve, are you excited for this Rick and Michonne? I mean, at least it's only six episodes, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's quick. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm super excited, to be honest with you, because Rick and Michonne are two of my three favorite characters on The Walking Dead, along with Negan. So I'm super psyched of seeing kind of what happened to Rick after he left The Walking Dead and kind of... Bri so this story bridges a lot of the spinoffs as well into like kind of back into a mainline story so i'm really curious as to how they're going to do that what rick's been up to for the last whatever is it like fucking some crazy like 11 years or whatever the in in world time has been and yeah it's gonna be awesome i can't wait to hear why he never went back like what's going on with him yeah whatever we saw at the finale yeah it's gonna be awesome i can't wait todd will you be tuning in i will you know when nice. i when i when i uh Stop watching The Walking Dead for, you know, a lot of people, same reasons, kind of got a little stale. But then when I picked it back up, I think when the last episode I watched was when a lot of lead characters got their heads cut off and put on posts, which is like, a, I'm like, oh, shit, like this, the show picked up for me. I don't know what season that was, Steve, but, I, you it's know, like nine, nine out of 10, 11, 11. I mean, like with anybody, like I was caught up in the fucking Walking Dead universe. Like it was like a Sunday night thing. We got fast food. We made a thing of it. And, you know, for better or worse, it, it continued on. But yeah, I'm excited because Negan's great and Andrew Lincoln's great. And I can't see where Rick is going. I want, can't wait to see where he's going. And then Negan has a spinoff too, right, Steve? Yeah, with Maggie. Okay, so that's it. Yeah, so I'm for it. Yeah, I mean, maybe since it's only six episodes, maybe I'll I'll try to jump on it and just see how it is. Uh, we I was actually having this conversation with uh, Sam earlier today about The Last of Us because she was like, you know, what do you think of The Last of Us? I was like, it's like really good so far. I was like, my concern is that it's going to turn into a like Walking Dead thing where it like gets a little like repetitive after a while. And I hope that won't be the case, you know, but I was like, I, they've been progressing the story like really fast and they really haven't been wasting much time. So, so far so good, you know, it's seven, seven episodes in, but I thought The Walking Dead was an amazing seven episodes in too. Uh, we'll see what happens. I, you know, I, I don't know if Last of Us will go like a 10 or 11 season i feel like they'll probably cut it off a lot quicker because hbo doesn't tend to do that with their series but we'll yeah, there's also only two games so it's not like okay, they have yeah. a 180 <laughs> uh comics to reference you know it's yeah, I think right. three four seasons at the most yeah i saw that this episode this last episode that aired this week was based on a dlc like content uh, yep. which I thought mm -hmm. was pretty interesting. So that's kind of cool. All right, file this next one under collectors are assholes. I don't know if you guys have been following the saga of the elusive Scream Ghostface popcorn tubs that have been released uh, from Cinemark. Um, people went absolutely fucking insane on these things. They, you know, sold out in just like, unbelievable timing i mean the movie hasn't even been released yet and people were literally like flocking to their cinemas to literally buy out th these uh popcorn bu uh, buckets i mean I, I will say they're pretty cool looking they're 15 dollars popcorn buckets they were selling them for people were literally going buying them all up um because there was no most theaters weren't setting limits so people were literally selling uh out the cinemas and then throwing them up on ebay for i saw as much as 200 dollars for one of these uh, popcorn buckets. Well, obviously there was a lot of controversy around that. And Cinemark did the right thing. Thank you, Cinemark, saying screw you to the scalpers out there. Uh, if you're a collector, you know all about the scalper market. It can be fucking brutal at times. I've never really bought into the scalpers. I, I'm just like, whatever. Like, if it, I don't get it, I don't get it. And, you know, that's what it is. Also, if people just relax, like wait a year or two, Usually those prices will, or maybe not even a year or two, sometimes a few months, those prices will come way the fuck down. So, you know, I, I, I'll say that for other stuff, but thank you to Cinemark. Head to Cinemark.com. They are um, do, doing pre-orders for these popcorn tubs for people that did miss out. Unfortunately, you won't receive them until August, but you won't be paying scalper prices for them. So with shipping, I think in, in America anyway, it comes to about, 
I think $25 shipped. So if you do want one, head on over to cinemark.com and you can get a popcorn, Coastface popcorn bucket, which I did get one. <laughs> With Canadian shipping, that goes up to $200. So sorry. Right. right. But uh, I, I actually love that move by Cinemark. That's, that's really yeah. legit. That's really mm-hmm. cool. Well, they probably saw how crazy it was and like we can make like fucking millions you know <laughs> like more dollars if we just if we do this so uh yeah but it, it's really awesome like most companies wouldn't give a shit and you know, just once they're sold out they're sold out so yeah definitely shout out to them for doing that thank you yeah. Mark. all right you knew it was going to happen folks with the success of cocaine bear you knew another studio was going to come out and do something crazy well leave it to asylum pictures who is known for doing these crazy uh, mockbuster type movies. Well, how about a little movie called Attack of the Meth Gator? That is right, ladies and gentlemen. It is coming out. We are going to be getting it as far as when it is going to be coming out. I don't see an actual release date for it, but here is a little plot synopsis. It says, hold our beer. I mean, hold our bear. I mean, beer coming for your life this summer is the meth gator actually there is no plot synopsis on this i apologize so all i can do is i will on our discord post a little picture of attack of the meth gator but it is going to be i'm sure something steve is 100 percent going to watch because he is a glutton for these terrible type movies but yeah so yeah attack of the meth gator folks coming out sometime probably this year i'm sure it's not gonna have much of a budget and it'll be mainly all cgi so sounds terrible all right, and uh, finally tonight, for anyone that enjoys going attending conventions and is a massive Halloween fan, it has been announced coming to Pasadena Convention Center later this year, Halloween convention for the 45th anniversary. They actually did this five years ago for the 40th anniversary. Nothing, no guests have been announced yet, but the convention will be is titled Halloween 45 Years of Terror and is going to be coming September 29th through October 1st. I know last um, five years ago, they had essentially like every single Michael living Michael Myers was there along with several other guests. No Jamie Lee Curtis, unfortunately, but pretty much anyone and everyone else in the Halloween franchise most likely will be there. So if you're a massive Halloween fan, definitely check that out. Uh, it's um, done by Horror Hound too, which is a legit, of course, convention company. So, you know, they're going to get some good guests out there for that so if you're in the pasadena era or if you just want to go check it out enjoy and that is it for horror news this week all right well after all that excitement i need a little pick me up for our next segment so let's do that with some deadly grounds coffee everyone thinks because you're a zombie you don't know good coffee well they're wrong there's only one brew that gets my seal of approval deadly grounds coffee is my guilty pleasure The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds Coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. What watched? Yes. I watched Candyland, a 2023 release which is about a truck stop group of sex workers, a couple girls and a dude, and they do their thing and we get to know them and their what they do throughout their day and their relationships with one another, things like that. They are accosted by a religious group one day and they think nothing of it until one of the girls from that religious group uh, turns up at the truck stop, like wanting asylum, basically. And they turn her out and turn her into a prostitute. Meanwhile, uh, truck stop uh, patrons Uh, the fine art of sex work are turning up dead and we're trying to follow along with these girls and guy and see what's going on i love this movie an easy top 10 for the year so far and what made me like it most uh, wasn't the horror it was the the characters like i liked all the girls i liked the guy who is the director slash boyfriend in x who gets you know his girlfriend gets banged by the dude and he cries and gets stabbed to death he plays an excellent character as well uh one of the bald ones is a, a sheriff i liked his character too so yeah just a, like a great character piece with really good acting and they took the sex work seriously and not like played for laughs which was uh different so candyland 
highly recommend. I gave it a four out of five. Excellent. Sounds like it's going to make all of our top tens this year. So yeah, that's great. I'm glad you guys dug it. Uh, all right. So my first one tonight is a little bit of a non-horror movie, but it is true crime. So I'm going to talk about it because I only had two movies really. And I only have one other horror movie, so I'm going to throw it out there. Um, okay. So I watched this over on Netflix and it is called Murdoch murders a Southern scandal. Now, I had no idea about this story. Um, it is currently ongoing, this Murdoch family. One of them is on trial right now for the murder of his wife. Um, but holy fuck, like this family has some fucking crazy shit going on, man. So the story starts, uh, it, it is a three-part series over on Netflix, so you can check it out. But essentially, the story starts with one of the sons gets drunk one night with his friends, and he drives the boat. And he ends up crashing the boat and one of the girls goes overboard, gets unconscious and, you know, tragically ends up dying. Only 19 years old, I believe she was. And essentially the, the family tried to like cover this up, try to say he wasn't the one driving and shit like that. What we also come and then like he is supposed to go on trial for her murder and negligence. And then like a couple months later, he's found murdered with his mother um and they think the father did it there's also mysterious stuff around um the housekeeper who died like five years prior who they said fell down the stairs there's just like all these mysterious deaths around this family um and they're very a very powerful family in south carolina he is like a lawyer super rich family so it's kind of like um like uh, kind of think, I guess, the Kennedys. I'm like, you know, they're just like this super powerful family where all of this tragedy is surrounding them and all these mysterious circumstances. Super interesting. Like I said, the uh, the court case is literally ongoing as we speak. You can watch like clips on YouTube and whatnot of, you know, them. Uh, I know, I think the father, the Murdoch father is uh, on trial right now and you can literally watch him. He took the stand just the other day. So I highly recommend uh, checking this out if you're into true crime. It's just a, a crazy, crazy story. Nice. Um, so my first one is a movie that I watched over on Tubi, despite it being a Shudder exclusive. It was unavailable on Shudder here in Canada. So who the fuck knows what's going on with that? But that is 2018's Nightmare Cinema. So this story uh, follows Mickey Rourke, who plays a theater owner and people... They kind of go into this theater kind of one at a time and on this he he's like a projectionist and he plays essentially their nightmare uh, and it serves as an anthology. There are five stories in this film ranging from a plastic surgery gone wrong to kind of a slasher with a guy with a blowtorch. There's a exorcism one with a priest and then uh, and a nun trying to exercise some children and just some other stuff like that. Honestly, if I had seen this uh, the year of, of its release, I might have put this in my top 10. I really, really, really enjoyed this film. The five stories are very unique. Like They're very diverse. They they each offer kind of their own little thing. Uh, they have these twists that I didn't necessarily see coming that I really liked for the most part. I was really entertained. Like it's uh, I had a lot of fun watching this. Mickey Rourke's not in it much. He's just kind of serving uh, as kind of the glue that holds all these anthologies together and i think it's some one that people should check out if you like anthologies the stories you know they they're like about 15 20 minutes each which is i think the perfect amount of time for anthology uh, stories and yeah honestly none of them were like terrible they're all pretty good one or two i thought was actually really good so uh, nightmare cinema i gave it four stars out of five on letterboxd and i enjoyed it quite a bit it's got Todd's favorite director, Mick Garris, too. I was it's looking at that right yeah. now, and I was like, which <laughs> one of these is this fucking dress? <laughs> All right. My next one is Paranormal Activity 2 from 2010. This is one I hadn't seen since release, and I didn't like it then. And, man, I still don't like it now. Uh, honestly, it's just like a lot of scenes of the dog, like looking at the wall. The dad never wanting to admit that there's a problem. The character's easily could have fixed and found out what was going on if they simply looked at video. There's one scene in particular where the burners on the stub go on and he blames it on a teenage daughter. Like, wouldn't you look at the video to see if she actually fucked up? Like, that's like easy solutions for these movies and they didn't even bother. 
there's a couple cool things at the end there where the ghost or demon or whatever starts rampaging but other than that man i was just fucking bored there's nothing scary about this and the best scene is the pool scene with the uh, katie from part one so one star for that out of five I enjoy the paranormal activity franchise, but I can see it's definitely not for everybody. I would say part three is worth a shot. If that's the one that's the prequel where they go back to when they were kids, that one was really good. So I would recommend continuing on at least to that one. And that's definitely pretty good too. The marked ones. I thought, yeah, the marked ones, I was gonna say the marked ones is really good too. Cause it's like a spinoff. Yeah. Yeah. Where it follows a, is it a Mexican family? Yeah. I believe right. in that one. It's yeah, it's mm-hmm. really good. Mm-hmm. All right. My next one you can check out over on Amazon Prime. It is a, I believe, 2022 release. I don't know. I just was randomly scrolling. Um, so I don't know if it came out this year or last year. Um, but the movie is, and it's Steve can attest to it because I saw he watched it. But the movie is called Significant Other. Did this did you watch this last year, Steve? Or is this a 2023 release? No, I watched it late last year. It was like one of my late cleanup last year. ones. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so it's from last year. Check it out on Amazon Prime. Significant Other. Uh, this one stars Jake Lacey, who is surprisingly becoming like a really one of my favorite actors. That dude is a legit, really good actor. You would know him best as Fake Jim from The Office, <laughs> but also several other roles. Most recently, he played his name. They call him Brother B on a show like where he oh, that um, TV show, right? Where he's yes, like, uh, creepy, yeah, really yeah. creepy yeah. shit. Hidden in Plain Sight was the name of the documentary. Um, I can't remember the name of the television show right now, but they made a series on it, and he plays a fucking real good creep, I gotta say. But it also stars uh, Micah Monroe, who also is becoming like one of my favorite horror actresses. She was in It Follows and Watcher uh, from last year as well, among other things. But yeah, so this one is about a couple who do a backpack backpacking trip out in the woods. She's never really gone before because she suffers from like really bad anxiety and whatnot. But uh, he uh, convinces her to go out, do like a backpacking trip for, I don't really know how long, obviously an overnight thing, but they're, tra- uh, you know, going through uh, the trails and whatnot. He ends up proposing to her, which she ends up saying no. And it creates kind of this like awkward sort of, tension between the two of them she ends up well he ends up going on a walk he comes back sort of acting i guess a little differently but she ends up going to pee and when she's out there she lo and behold discovers that something is awry and he might not be her boyfriend anymore and i'll kind of leave it at that because uh i don't want to get too spoilery here Overall, I think this, like, man, this movie started really fucking well, and I was really, really enjoying it. But then in the second half, it takes, like, a weird turn where it really just, to me, kind of, like, goes off the rails. Because, it, it, man, it, the tension was so good in the beginning, and it was really subtle, and then it just, like, blows it all up. And it takes this really just, like, in-your-face, sort of goofy turn and it just i just couldn't stay on the the ride for lack of a better word for it but you know it's not like a a terrible movie i definitely was never bored it is definitely has some interesting elements it kind of feels like a long episode of the twilight zone yeah i mean i gave it three out of five over on letterbox i think it's a a decent one-time watch but nothing you really have to rush out to go see all right. So my last one this week is a brand new movie that just came out, 2023 film that I watched over on Netflix, and it's called We Have a Ghost. So this is directed by Christopher Landon, who actually directed Paranormal Activity Marked Ones, as we were just talking about. Uh, also, Happy Death Day series, uh, Freaky. So this movie is kind of in that same style as Happy Death Day and Freaky, kind of a horror, but kind of kind of not happy horror, but a little more, I guess, pop horror than uh, other films. So this one follows a family who are down on their luck and they have to move into kind of an abandoned slash haunted house in a neighborhood. And uh, one one of the kids, he's kind of having a really tough time with it. And he goes into the attic and he meets a ghost played by David Arbor, who uh, people would know as Hopper in the Stranger Things uh, franchise oh, TV show. And uh, the family, the head of the family is played by Anthony Mackie, who's, of course, Captain America right now, and also very famous on this podcast because he uh, once played Striking Vipers with his friend on an episode of um, Black Mirror, which I won't go into that whole thing. But uh, yeah, so it's about this 
this family who find this ghost in their attic and at first the the kid wants to kind of help him out just because he's a good kid and he's like obviously if you're a ghost you must have some unfinished shit and some problems and i'm gonna try to help you out with it but the dad played by anthony mackie he sees it as an opportunity to get rich so he films the ghost and then posts it on youtube and then it goes viral and then it becomes this whole thing about everyone is wondering whether or not it's a real ghost the government gets involved it, it becomes this kind of whole crazy thing the son doesn't like it because his intention the whole time was just to help uh, david arbor's ghost whereas his family seems to want to exploit it so that's i'll stop it there because i don't want to go into what it's ultimately about but that's the gist of it uh this movie is super well acted it's uh it's you know it's, it's a black family which i really love because we don't see a ton of uh, stories where it's a whole black family and how they're dealing with things it gives a different perspective on what they're going through and i really like that uh, really really good acting all around david arbor doesn't say a word or practically doesn't say a word the whole movie because the ghost can't really talk so he does a silent performance and he does a really good job at that i will say the cgi is spotty it's really not great it kind of reminds me of the frighteners uh, the way that the ghost is presented and the Frighteners is made in fucking the 90s. So if they haven't improved that technology in 2023, you need to work on your CGI a little bit. It's a it's a decent film. You know, it's one that I don't think is overly memorable or anything. I do find it a bit too long. It's over two hours, and that's there's just not enough story to cover that much uh, runtime. But ultimately, I still thought it was a good one-time watch, and that's a Netflix original. I gave it three stars out of five. So that's We Have a Ghost. Very cool. I think it's time for trivia. The points are as follows. Joe, in a commanding six-point lead with 16 over myself at 10, with Steve at 9. This is unacceptable on every level. No way is Joe going to take this. I'm not, I'm not allowing it to happen. Let's fucking go right now. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Look at this crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my word. I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> my maniacal laugh. All right, why well, you start, Joe? All right, I can start us off tonight. Uh, my first <laughs> question, my first question tonight is from Kayla. Oh, and my yeah. other two are Joe Originals. So thank you, oh. Kayla, for my first question. All right, what book did Tiffany use to bring back Chucky in Bride of Chucky? Um, uh, I don't know. The, the Voodoo book, Guy. The Book of Spells. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> voodoo for uh, dummies. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Oh, wow. You got it, baby. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, I guess we're due for a Bride of Chucky rewatch. Yeah, it's yeah, been a while. <laughs> Teenager Todd, along with everyone else, loved that movie for a couple big reasons. I'm sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Number one for me. And this is going to be three letterbox Ooh. clues. So I like this and I decided to take my own. However, I'm not quoting the entire review from the from the from the users just a sure. snippet that yes. i think works okay. i don't do that either. yeah yeah, okay, yeah cool. it's, it's, uh, right. I, I, they, they like, have to be this. they have to be short or <laughs> right. take a snippet. Yeah. Yeah. clue number one this movie is just old-fashioned horror oh okay clue number two overall i enjoyed it and i can see my score changing after thinking about it uh but for now it's a four out of five and I know these aren't really <laughs> yeah, you got it right. <laughs> but they're, they're, I, got, I got, I have a, I have a strategy that I'm gonna reveal after this. All right. I feel like this is either my one of my reviews or one of Steve's reviews. It is. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and the clue that is not related to either either of you two is I fucking hate old people. They always do shit like this. X. Correct. X. Yeah. That yeah. I actually had that after the last one somehow. I don't know that's why. That's a great idea. That's a good idea, though. It's, t- it's taking our reviews. Yeah. yeah. Joe, Joe, yours was, you let off with this movie is just old fashioned horror. And then Steve's right. was at the end of his review, four out of five. Love it. All right. So my first one is Guess a Movie based off the IMDb trivia. Mm, okay. There were no exterior shots in the film because production team could not afford them. Okay. The the car chase was filmed in the garage of the warehouse by turning off the lights, adding smoke fog, and shaking the cars while filming from the front. Oh wow! Interesting. Car chase interiors. 
the composer had just three weeks to compose the score of the film. Wow. The creator, in an interview, stated that the two main characters were originally supposed to be trapped in an elevator. This is the last one. Okay. The cloak the villain wears is actually turned inside out. Wow. So, so such a low budget that they had to do all interior shots. Composer did a classic score, I'll say, in three weeks. The movie was supposed to take place in an elevator, but didn't. Saw? Correct. Nice. Wow. All yeah. right. <laughs> so they, they made a, a bathroom because elevator was impractical for shooting. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that would have been weird to have that in the cool. elevator. My other guess was going to, my other thought was Devil, which yeah. that's a good movie too. It's been a while. But... Yeah, I'm glad you didn't guess that because it took place in elevator. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to me. Mm-hmm. All right. One of my personal favorites, maybe not Stephen Todd's, but match uh-huh. the killer to the movie. Mm. I, I don't know why Tonight. we're so bad at this. Honestly, it's kind of frustrating. <laughs> Probably because, like, outside of Michael Myers, Jason Ford, he's like, you don't know the fucking name. Right. All right. Tonight's killer, folks, is Roy Burns. Oh, uh, Friday Thirteenth Part Five. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Fucking Roy, piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Guess the movie by these three actors. Okay. Actor number one, David Arquette. Okay. Actor okay. number two, Rucker Hauer. Take a pause there. Oh, oh wait. Uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Fucking shit. Yeah, yes. fuck yeah. Damn it. <laughs> There's only been Hillary Swank. Damn, yeah. damn it, damn it. Retro. I, I think... <laughs> Our uh, karaoke with David Arquette, so me and him are simpatico. (laughs) (laughs) Joined at the hip, you guys. All right. Uh, So my this one is a guest the movie, based off the Letterbox review. Okay. They are not your reviews. (laughs) (laughs) The best part was when my friend turned to me and whispered, "What if we can't get out of the cinema?" No. Okay. Wish wow. I could escape those last 15 minutes. Hmm. Oh. And last one. Wildly entertaining, but brimmed with cliches. The upside down room is superb. Escape room. Escape Correct. room, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm coming for you, brother. Yes. I, I had a theme going for my first two questions. A, <laughs> a both bit similar to Cube. Both escape rooms. <laughs> Nice. But yes. not 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 my third one. So FYI. All right. All right. Back to me. Last one. Yes. All right. Three letterbox reviews. Guess the movie. I've smoked a lot of crack with tons of hookers, but <laughs> wait, is this like an autobiography real quick? Or... Well, yeah, right. <laughs> Joe All the right. story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've smoked a lot of crack with tons of hookers, but I've never been to a party where everyone brought their own crack pipe. All right. All right. Number two. (laughs) If you're looking for a thoughtful portrayal of the pain and sorrow of losing a loved one, the lengths that one will go to in order to be with them again, as well as a sensitive study on the trials and tribulations of a prostitute in New York City circa 1990s, then this is absolutely... Not the film for you. That is correct. Nice. What was the other clue? <laughs> uh, my last clue is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was one crack whore away from becoming uh. a feminist masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> We're going back to four clues. Okay. Clue number one. A bunch of hot chicks. Oh. Clue number two. Love it. <laughs> I'm for it. Let's go deep inside this hole. Oh. Oh, uh, what's second? I know. Oh, the descent. Yeah, fuck. Steve, you gotta be fucking quicker. <laughs> I, I couldn't this think of it. I could picture it. I could. I couldn't think of the name. Oh man, my my other yeah, sexual baby. innuendo number three would have been ouch, don't bite, and then underground creatures. So, son of a bitch. All right, <laughs> all right. I'm bringing back an old favorite of yours. This is guess the movie in sixty seconds. <laughs> We haven't oh, done it in like months. Rusty. 
So who wants to go first? Because it depends. One of them is a little easier than the other. So who wants to go first? Oh. I'll go first. All right. So 60 seconds. So the rules, quick, just for everyone to remember, you have 60 seconds. You can throw out as many questions as you'd like. It uh, has to be a yes or no answer for me. And after 60 seconds, you uh, Joe you know, gets a it's one still. last question and then can answer once. Okay. Are you ready? Go. Let's do it. All right. And go. Slashers. Um, no. Uh, you just threw me off your bid. <laughs> Slashers. Zombies. No. A car. There's a car in it. Well, yeah, but is it? Is no, it's not about cars. Okay. <laughs> is it a uh, 80s movie? No. Is it a 90s movie? No. Is it a 2010 onward? Yes. Okay. Are we a cabin in the woods? No. Okay. Are we outside most of the time? No. Do we have main Hollywood actors or is it low budget? Uh, main, main Hollywood, Hollywood actors. actors. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is it a possession type movie? Religious horror? No. Uh, is it ghosts? Nope. Uh, is it a, um, a stalking movie? A what? A stalker. Stalking? A stalker. But, yeah, like a stalker. Not really. Oh, oh my God. It's not a slasher. Really. And it's a little bit of a... Is it, um, is it a sports-related horror film? No, and that, that is time are. for you. Right. <laughs> so, Joe, not job, much Joe. to go Sorry. off. You have one question, one answer. Kind of a slasher, Joe. Here's I your clue. Kind of slasher. Well, you went. Eh. No, it's not a slasher. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's not that. It's uh, is it a stalker that I was? Yeah. No. Kind of a slasher. There's kind of a stalker, Joe. So there you go. Mm hmm. Um. <laughs> I, was, I was getting good at these two. In, in the 2010s. In the, yes. 2010. I got one answer. The strangers. Oh, well, you can ask the question first if you want. No, I'm just guessing. The okay, strangers. No, it's not. <laughs> so it was 2014's Tusk. Oh. Ah, Mr. Body, Tusk. Body horror. Mr. Tusk. All right. Okay. You ready, Joe? Sure. Go. Okay. Is it uh, 70s? No. Nope. 80s? No. 90s? 2000s. Yes. Okay. Early 2000s. All right. 2005. No. Or later. No. No. Oh, okay. So it's early 2000s. Okay. Um, is it a movie uh, we've reviewed on this podcast? No. Okay. Is it uh, a slasher? Uh, no, not really. A little bit, but not really. Ghost movie. Um, was it a wide release theatrical movie? I believe so. Okay. Did it do well? Has is it well received? Uh, I don't think it did well in theaters, but it, people look fondly on it. Okay. All right. Um, it, it does it have a lot of merchandise? Some, but not much. Some, but not much. Okay. Does it have like a an icon, iconic killer? Not really. And that is, I'll give you a final guess. All right. All right. Early 2000s. Um, the others. Wrong. And uh, Todd, one last question. One this last game's answer. hard, man. It's hard. It's, <laughs> we need like seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> did you say, did you say ghost, Joe? No, it's not ghost. Not he did ask. Does that, but... does, that, oh, that, does that count as my question? I asked no, and no, I forgot, doesn't. and I guessed no. the others. So I just... no. <laughs> was it was it animal based? I'd say yes. No, oh. kind of animal. Well, kind of. It, yeah, kind of. It's 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 <laughs> you'll, you'll, it's tough. You'll you'll see what I answer. Um, that kind of gave me an idea. Yeah, did it give you an idea. Um, go ahead and send me a private message. <laughs> 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 kind of like animals, early two thousands um let's see anaconda was 90s that's not it plus that's definitely animals kind of like animals early 2000s fuck me dude is it that snake movie wrong uh yeah. i'm not giving it to joe because he has too many points but i think he had the right idea somehow <laughs> what do you think uh i mean i once you said kind of animal based my thought kind of went to 28 days later wrong so it was actually ginger snaps so oh, werewolf guess, yeah, yeah, okay. is not it's kind of an animal but not you know sure so i was going for canadian horror 
So cube. I did, oh, uh, nice. I, I did tricky, two tricky. two escape horrors and one can, yeah, two Canadian tricky, horrors. Tricky. Yes. Once they started saying Zed in the movie, I knew right away. I was like, oh, this is a Canadian movie, eh? All right. <laughs> okay. So tonight's scoring is uh, Joe and I both had three. Steve had two, which brings us up to Joe nineteen, myself thirteen, Steve eleven. Woo. We have one month left in first quarter 2023, mm-hmm. and then it's punishment. Let's go, baby. And then punishment will probably be fierce after what oh. I made him watch for the Super Bowl. Yes. <laughs> Steve will enjoy it, though. You kidding me? All the shit like, he watches. You know what? <laughs> you know, he, would say, like, he would say all this shit, and right. they'd be like, you know what? I kind of liked it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I gotta find I gotta find a movie that has like 20 awful sequels to go with it because then Steve will watch <laughs> right, them all. Right. <laughs> all right, Cube 1997, directed by Vincenzo Natale. Don't look for a reason, look for a way out. A group of strangers find themselves trapped in a maze like prison. It soon becomes clear that each of them possesses the peculiar skills necessary to escape if they don't wind up dead first. Uh, we are immediately thrown into this film with a character that wakes up and he's just wandering around this cube-like structure with different lighting. There's no clues. There's no like hints, tape recordings, anything like that. You're just in a prison jumpsuit and you're just fucking going through these cubes, um, which has a hatch on either end. So he jumps into his room and is in instantly uh, attacked by the, a wire mesh that swings down and just pieces him out, right? It's, uh, think of the laser trap in Resident Evil, but with wire. And his body just slides apart and he fucking falls to the earth, or actually to the cube floor. We are slowly introduced to other characters who don't remember a lot, if anything at all. They all don't trust each other. We have a cop, we have a doctor, uh, we have a college student, we have just fucking this creepy guy, and we have a mental handicap person that shows up. And they, we just follow them as they try to, oh, and we have a guy that is an escape artist for prisons. So we follow them as they try to figure out where the fuck they are who they are, how they relate to one another, and how to get out of this seemingly never-ending maze, essentially, with traps. Watched this a long time ago, and I loved it. It's in my top 90s easily. And rewatching it every about five years or so, so this is the first time in about five years, and I still like it. It holds up really well. There are some nitpicks that we'll get into later, uh, acting, uh, some kind of character choices, things like that. But overall, I'm really into this film, and we'll move on to you guys. Uh, yeah, I, I think I saw this movie like a long time ago, but this was like, felt like a very, very fresh watch. I remembered like a few scenes here and there. I thought this movie started like really well, like the opening scene, like immediately catches your attention with that great kill with my boy, Julian Richens. Shout out to him. Love him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a pretty like solid movie, but I definitely have a lot of issues with it. It feels like a made for TV, not made for TV, but like a straight to video movie, which I don't know if it was or not, but that definitely is the feeling I got while watching it. You know, it's an interesting like character study, obviously, like about society and the roles we play in it and stuff like that. But ultimately, I was left like a bit frustrated because I feel like we got no answers like whatsoever. And like, I know that's maybe not what the director was going for. Obviously, he was going for more of the societal themes and stuff like that and that's fine but i uh, you know for the movie to be a whole i just wish we got some sort of answers and it's left with none (laughs) and i kind of had a problem with that i mean i enjoyed it for what it was but i wish we got more basically is how i felt uh when we when i finished it all right, so I uh, picked it. So each of us had been like picking a movie, and this was my pick. I hadn't seen it in a long, long time, and we reference it once in a while. And I always thought that this is one we should do. It's also a Canadian indie film, so I thought that would be cool to do one day. Uh, so I was happy to revisit it. And I gotta say, I remembered it fairly well, even though it'd been probably 20 years since I've seen it. And I did still really like it, but maybe not as much as I remembered. And I think part of the reason is I've seen other escape room movies since then, like Saw, like Escape Room, like, and this one maybe goes a little bit too minimalist compared to some of the other ones. Like I thought Escape Room went too much into the like too crazy, too big, you know, unrealistically big. Whereas this one, in a way, even though it's a gigantic cube and the fucking rooms move around and shit, 
it almost felt like it was too small. You know, it's basically just the same room over and over with different colors, but they're only like four or five colors. It's not like there's a ton of different colors either. But so it's a cool movie because it does play on you know society and how people work with each other and it's almost like an escape room for nerds too because it's very math based and very like sequence based and stuff like that so if you like that kind of stuff i think you'll be really into it i dig the 70s vibe even though it was a 90s film it has a really like the color palette the way that the shape of the cube is i thought was really interesting and yeah it was a you know fun revisit I don't think it's like one of the best films necessarily, but it's one that I personally enjoy watching. Uh, well, yeah, I guess every 20 years. Top 10 in the 90s still? It, it wasn't in my, it was an honorable was mention. Because, oh. uh, I don't know. I don't think I'd put it in my top 10 in the 90s. Yeah, I like it, man. I have a lot of nostalgic feelings towards it. It was like one of my first DVDs I bought and... I can see, yeah, like when I was reviewing it, I'm like, should I leave it at what I put it at? And we'll spoil it yet. I'm like, you know, ultimately I still like it a lot. So I left it there. But I think it's a really unfair movie. Like at least with Saw, like you get a die, right? But at least you have like a way out and a warning and like explanation. But this is like you wake up not knowing a fucking thing and you can walk into a room and just fucking die. Like where is the, I guess to Joe's point too, there's no explanation. Where is the gamesmanship i guess with that you know not like not giving the characters even a remote chance of knowing what's going on like you can take a wrong step and you're fucking frozen or burned or whatever it is so like i would die in this because what steve mentioned the mathematical shit i'm i suck at math the memorization of rooms i would i can't even do those fucking word card games and then when they have to do the fucking climbing across the roof shit i i would fucking fall and break my legs so i don't know about you guys yeah, I mean, man, watching it, like, it almost felt like a uh, very uh, Clive Barker-esque in a lot of ways, too. Obviously, like, it felt like they were, like, kind of inside of uh, the Lament configuration of Hellraiser. Like, I definitely got those vibes from it, um, which I thought was was pretty cool. But I agree with Steve that it is very minimal. You know, I wish we got more. Like, I wish maybe there were more people in the box so we could have got some more kills. Because every time there was a kill, they were pretty cool. Like, you know, there were some cool stuff. But yeah, I mean, like I, I did find, like I, I never felt myself like extremely bored, but there were a couple times like I felt like it was dragging because it, it was literally just them in like a empty a blank room, which I mean, in a way, like obviously I'm assuming this movie had like no budget <laughs> like whatsoever. I mean, it's, and it's impressive that you could pull off a movie like this with pretty much a nothing budget and still make it fairly entertaining. I definitely felt it was dated for the 90s. Like those, some of those effects definitely were like, felt like CD-ROM a la Tickles the Clown uh, type stuff going on <laughs> and some of these Boy, things. But watch yeah. Cube 2 then, <laughs> if you're into that. Oh, really? Okay, <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't watched the sequels yet. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was just a little too minimal. I, I wish we got, like, there was some, like, cool stuff in these traps and stuff like that, other than just kind of, you know, these, whatever you want to call them, these rods that came out that kind of pierced through your skin. You know, I, I it could have been a little more interesting. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was... It, it was, it was okay. It had, it had, it was entertaining. Like I liked all of, I felt like all the characters, like they were a little too, a little cliche, obviously. Like you had, you know, the alpha male, you had, you know, the woman that had the compassion, you had the mathematician, uh, you know, and you had the, the person with special needs who ends up being kind of the savior, you know, who, who ends up being, you know, a highly functioning Astro kind of autistic savant. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting, you know, and whatnot, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted more at the end of the day i mean i know i keep saying it but just like like where are our answers like who are these people who created this cube like you know who the fuck like who, like where is it aliens is it a, you know he said he was contracted though to build it so i guess it's real people who created this but why the fuck did they create it you know <laughs> yeah it's so the movie is made for three hundred sixty-five thousand, which is really nothing right so it's a very very indie movie and they did in that regard, they reused the space really well, right? Because they probably only had like two rooms that they were going back and forth with and somehow create an entire movie off that concept, which I thought was interesting. Now, I'm not excusing it for this, but 
you do find out, especially in Cube Zero, kind of what the deal of the cube is, but you shouldn't have to rely on sequels to tell a story. You know, I do agree with uh, that point, but I did really like the character. Like, it's a very cool character uh, exploration as to ha- what happens when you put these diverse types of people uh, together. And it, it kind of reminds me of why I watch Survivor. I don't watch much TV anymore, especially reality TV, but I've been watching Survivor for like 45 seasons. And it's basically that, right? You're always putting, uh, you know, a number of people on an island and it's the last one to survive. And what it comes down to is the personalities, right? How do you, and they try to mix with that. Okay, they put old people versus young people. They put uh, athletic people against nerds. And it's just this interesting social commentary. And that's what I think I love so much about this movie. It shows, what would I have done in this situation? You know, who would I align with? Uh, Would I have wanted to... You know, like the the person who has um, mental disabilities, like, yeah, you want to care for him and everything, but your life's on the line and he's screaming when you're supposed to be quiet. And it's just, you ask yourself a lot of these questions. And I think the movie explores those questions in an interesting way. So I I liked a lot for that. Kazan, my man. I thought, oh, yeah, and he loves good. And come, on, I mean, I gotta, I gotta knock him for a second, man. I don't know how you can't like red gumdrops because they're fucking delicious. So he said they were his least favorite, and I love them. So sorry, man. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't. I mean, what, like, how did you guys like? I guess I, I feel like there was, was a little convenient too. Like they're supposed to not be making sounds, but they're fucking like opening that door. That's clearly making a loud enough noise that would fucking explain easily it, oh did you not did watch they? it yes what did they say what is okay maybe i missed that part yeah Go they said it. something a throw, they had a throwaway line it's not yeah if it's part of the machine it doesn't yeah. oh okay i guess you know, i missed that get all out right. of here with your <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right but i assume they put everyone in there for, like all these people like obviously they put this mathematician in to solve this thing right like I, it's like it's almost like they're doing like a scientific character study on these people i guess to see is that how cube zero i mean i guess you can you spoil it just spoil cube zero like what 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 is their reasoning i guess there really is none no they don't even like throw that out there uh, no so uh, we watched I, both todd and i watched both cube two and cube zero uh so cube two is basically the same movie except all the rooms are white for some really reason bad. <laughs> and everything is cgi <laughs> and really bad cgi at Awful. that tickles the clowns better cgi <laughs> right uh but cube zero does it it follows the people who are like kind of watching uh the contestants from outside of the cube and then you get to see the people who are the leaders uh, or at least one of the higher ups of who makes the decisions for the cube and he doesn't give a good explanation that's kind of a problem it's kind of just they want these people killed and they put him in this box and it's just like, it's a control thing. Right. Uh, yeah. I wish they had a better explanation. Like they chose these people specifically because if they work together, they can get out. If they don't work together, they die. And that's kind of like humanity. Like if you, if we hate each other for our differences, we're going to fail. But if we can look past all our differences and work together, then society will, you know, it's very, it's actually very relevant right now. I find because I find that our world has never been more divided, at least in our lifetime. And if people actually got together and forgot that petty bullshit, maybe it'd be a stronger place in the world. But so we're not. you're saying we should build a cube. That's right. And put people in it. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. in. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, it was funny. I was writing like this lengthy defense of Quentin right when he fucking let that girl die. <laughs> and then I had to delete all of it. I'm like, gosh, damn it, Quentin. But like, through the majority of the movie like he's actually a voice of reason like everyone's like fucking around and stuff and to your point steve like would you risk your life for the handicapped gentleman that like has struggles to get through the basic stuff like and he almost killed quentin accident absolutely but brings back to your point again is like would you what would you do like would you go back would you help her get out of there things like that and then he lets her go and i'm like motherfucker quentin damn it and he i love quentin because he picks on worth the entire time like, even when Worth isn't even doing anything, he talks shit to him. And, uh, I mean, how did that guy rip that fucking handle off that door and stab him with it? It's got, right. like, superhuman strength. <laughs> but one of the funniest scenes, I don't know if you guys caught it, but um, <laughs> when Levin figures out the, the words, the girl with the glasses, 
he says, Levin, you're a genius. And she puts her glasses on and pokes herself in the eyeball with like the end of the glass. And I just thought that was like, I'm like, why did they not reshoot that scene? And it was just so fucking funny to me. She pokes herself in the eyes and just plays it off. But uh, I don't know, like, what would you guys do? Would you guys lone wolf it? Or would you would you leave the ha- mentally handicapped person to die? Like, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I would probably end up helping him uh, just because I have like a soft spot for people with uh, mental disabilities. So I'd probably try to, I'd, I'd, I'd my, the expense of my own life, I would probably try to help him just because, you know, uh, that's my personality. But I, I can also see why someone wouldn't, you know, if you're really trying to survive and stuff like that. So yeah, I guess that's my personal. Sure. I, I would like to think I would, but when thrown in that situation, I think a lot of people go to the kind of fight or fly type mode. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like in those situ in a moment in moments of survival you have to sort of be selfish to survive unfortunately (laughs) um but yeah i think like i always think about this like in these apocalypse shows and movies and yeah i think it's it's a very tough situation and scenario to be to be put in and yeah i mean and that's and that's the great thing about this movie is it kind of throws out these ideas and thoughts that kind of make you think about what you would do in that your own situation and maybe question, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, about your motives and stuff. You know, And yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So I, I would like to think I would, but thrown in that situation, I think things could possibly change. Yeah. Sadly. And, you know, there's two different thoughts too, like, or two different people actually, like you have Quentin who murders mur- straight up murder. You know what I mean? And then you have the other, the flip of it, where it's like, to your point too, like you, sometimes you gotta make that selfish choice. So like, is the selfish choice as bad as a murder? Well, I guess it's up to interpretation, right? But in <laughs> moving on to, to part two, uh, Steve, did you notice the guy that had the booger in his nose? <laughs> Have you <ever> seen? Yes. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, we're not having makeup check for boogers. <laughs> Like, come on. Is it the same two, director? Like for all no, these, or no, none of these. Yeah. Two is sloppy. Two is a oh, not a, two yeah, is terrible. It's, it's bad. Cube Zero is not the worst. It's got some really goofy elements, and I know you you saw that as well, Todd. But because uh, the main like villain in it has this like Ugh. super badly fucking put on. He has like a fake eye, but it's so obviously makeup and like a, a, you know, prosthetic. Worst. It just doesn't look good at all. But uh, yeah. It's yeah, so Cube Two, Cube Two is set in the future, and like we're talking like quantum physics and shit, <laughs> and every kill is CG, and it's awful. Like we're talking, it, it's terrible. Like heads will get cut off, but you'll see like they just digitally took the guy's head and slid it backwards and stuff like that. So that one's like the worst. And Cube Three, I actually think is really really good until the higher ups come down, and we have that goofball fucking character with his wonky eye and like. I forget, he just seemed like he seems like a character, you know, not not a person. He seems like, let's make you as wonky as possible with your stupid eye. And I, I hated it. So, but little twist, Joe, in the first, or I'm sorry, in the Cube Zero, the third movie, the main character is super smart as well. And he gets through the system, but then they don't like it. So they um, disable his brain or whatever and make him mentally handicapped, which he acts exactly like the dude in Cube Part One. That's been the happy gap. So maybe that's like a punishment. Yeah. We'll see. I so know. I have a question for you guys. So for it's for both of you guys, but Todd, ignore Cube Two and Zero, okay? As if they never happened, and Cube is the only movie we saw. What do you think the Cube ultimately was if you're just looking at Cube as its own entity? Uh yeah, I think it was. You know, I wanted to say it was like aliens studying us until, of course, that guy said it was that that he was contacted to build it. So I think it is these super powerful, rich people that maybe have created a game and so they're squid, be- like betting game, on essentially. Basically, basically, yeah, essentially, it's like squid. Yeah, it, exactly, like a squid game type scenario where they're kind of betting on who is going to be the one to get out. Yeah, I thought it was some kind of government entity that would just, you know, throw 
undesirable prisoners or political opponents or something into the grinder and further amusement. Yeah. See, I, I'm kind of with Joe on this one. I thought it was all a game, essentially. And I almost would have liked the ending to be when he walks out thinking he's outside. He walks into out to like a studio audience, kind of like Running Man. You know, like you have a fucking goofy oh, host God. and you have a bunch of people like clapping for him as if it was all a big game to people, you know, like like the Running Man. So I think that it would have been awesome. It just doesn't make sense to me that it would be anything like really else because like the fact that they put all of these like very convenient, like, you know, the mathematician that it obviously is going to be able to solve this shit or attempt to solve this stuff, you know, a highly functioning uh, autistic person, you know, and then an alpha male, like it's just all too convenient. You know what I mean? So I, I hope I like to think that it's, it, it's all for some sort of reason. I would have loved to see a movie of the escape artist, the Renz. Right. He was cool. And he was, he was gone way too early in this film. And he's French yeah. Canadian, so fuck him. <laughs> no. yeah. I, I was, I was honestly surprised they killed that one woman off kind of early, like when he drops her, you know, because I felt like she was kind of the main character for a lot of it, and then they kind of get rid of her. That was, um, that was this, his like his opposition, right? He had, he had to get yeah. Rid of her. yeah, right. Had to get rid of her. Yeah, I, I thought for sure too, like someone was going to be like in on it. You know what I mean? Like, I know that guy sort of kind of was, but not really. Like I thought there was going to be someone at the end that was kind of going to be like, stop them from kind of escaping the cube. And like, you know, he's kind of like the mole in there. I thought maybe it was going to be the autistic guy for a long period of time. Like I thought he was maybe kind of like acting or something like that. And then was going to fucking end up being just like the fucking like mastermind and like, yeah, kills them all or something like that and goes i thought something like that was gonna happen but it just yeah no like saw two <laughs> yeah it sort of yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe i'm just thinking about all these other different movies i'm trying to yeah, create, it just, it, it just create my own mo- plot this movie is kind of ahe- ahead of its time you know because a lot of movies sure, yeah kind of took this it concept was. in a way and uh made something you know in some cases better in some cases worse so yeah yeah that's the mm-hmm. problem with reading like you know 1950s pulp sci-fi too like every sci-fi after that has taken all these ideas so like you think it's old you know or already done but like yeah cube was one of the the first like indie fucking trap movies right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah, it was it was unique for its time like now like watching it back now it's like you've seen so many of those movies that it's like hard not to compare them you know but yeah back then absolutely it was kind of its own thing i want to reboot yeah, actually, I, just, uh, I think so, it'd be perfect for uh, it. Yeah. Japan just made a reboot. Uh, oh, really? Or, oh. or a remake in 2021. Oh, I'm, cool. gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have to is find it. Called, it. Is it called Cube? In it's just called Japanese? Cube. It's just Cube, yeah. Cube, cool. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, I see it. And something that's interesting uh, for Joe or for the listeners who haven't watched the series in Cube 2, the rooms, they do something different as well in some cases, like time speeds up. So you like move no. super fast or slows down or they mummy float. Sex. And, yeah. And they have like, yeah, they have this super <laughs> weird scene where yeah, mummy sex. there's like, yeah, these two mummies are sex. <laughs> what? So yeah. See, like so that kind of CGI fucks sucks. me up. Like how could, so that, so that kind of lends to the idea that maybe it is aliens. Cause how it's the in fuck the future, are you speeding so. up time? Oh, it's the, okay. It's, it's, it's like, future. yeah, it's, it's in the future. It's way a, in it's the a, future. It's okay. a tesseract or whatever they call them. Right. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, my rating has dropped down half a star <laughs> after talking and you guys make good points. And I do think it's, it, it drags a bit, you know, there, there's a lot of scenes where they're just like reading numbers and walking, reading numbers and walking and making fun of worth and Quentin growling and things like that. Um, so if you guys are ready to rate it, once Steve, why don't you go first since this is your pick? Yeah. So same thing happened to me. I originally had it at four stars uh, off memory but I think after rewatching it, putting it down to three and a half stars, I still liked it. I still think it's important to film because I think a lot of movies took from there. And it's one I wouldn't mind like watching again in maybe 10 years or something like that. But as it stands after rewatching it, it does slow down a part. Some parts a little goofy and I wish I had more explanation. So three and a half, I think is still a decent score for this movie. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the movie had a lot of a lot of potential, but I just don't think it ever really reached it. And I think a lot of that is probably because of its budget and all its budgetary reasons and whatnot. But I mean, as it was, I was never really bored. I thought it was still a, a really entertaining movie, a lot of interesting thoughts in it and whatnot. So yeah, I'm, I'm also going to give it a three and a half. I think it's a, a solid movie. I just, I think it could have been great had we gotten some more answers and whatnot, but as it stands, three and a half. All right, I'm going to be higher um, at a solid four out of five. I like it a lot. It takes me back to when I watched it. It's one of those movies that, you know, you remember when you were a kid watching it, things like that. I think it's really cool, but I also see all your guys' criticisms as valid. So I think this would be a good film to watch when you don't need 100% involvement. You know, you're maybe doing something, working on homework if you're a student or something like that. It'd be a good one to have on in the background and, you know, catch some of the cool kills. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah this is a good one to watch like probably by yourself like it's not definitely not like a good group setting movie really <laughs> you know it's just kind of one like that i mean i watched it on on uh my elliptical so that worked out well <laughs> all right guys so that is going to wrap it up uh this week we hope you enjoyed our review of cube don't forget to stick around for the interview at the end of the episode with steve take it away with tom ryan who is the director of the upcoming film return to the theater of terror uh, which you can pre-order uh, the dvd on his website he explains it all in the interview so uh yeah check it out it's a it's a cool anthology film okay awesome so definitely stick around for the interview after this little spiel but next week we are planning to review knock at the cabin the new m night Shyamalan thriller which is available to watch at home uh right now so you can check it out i'm not sure the rental price but i don't think too too bad bucks. Is it 20 bucks? Shit. All right. Last well, game I checked. So. <laughs> All right. For, well, for, the high part, for the high price of $20. But we are going to review it because uh, I know we've been very excited for it. And Todd um, read the book. So it'll be a good discussion to talk about the difference between the book and the movie. So go and check out Knock at the Cabin if you haven't yet. In the meantime, make sure to follow us on all of our social medias, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, The Horror Squad Podcast. You can email us anytime, the Horror Squad Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, the absolute best way is the discord all you can do is send us a pm and we will send you a direct link to join our discord completely free of charge and there are several different channels over there to talk anything and everything horror and non-horror so check that out uh, movie clubs every month maybe book club will come back at, at some point um we'll see about that todd we're looking at you like three um, pe- there's like three people that read now like i know Book Club's dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, Book Club has died for now, but Movie Club definitely uh, very strong. And I think that's about it. So we'll see you guys next week for Knock at the Cabin and stick around for our interview with Tom Ryan. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast, where today we have a special guest. He is a writer and director of films like Faces and The Theater of Terror. He's here to promote his upcoming film, Return to the Theater of Terror, Tom Ryan. Tom, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me on, Steve. I appreciate it. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about Return to the Theater of Terror? Sure. Theater of Terror is a four-film anthology. It's the sequel anthology to my 2019 release, The Theater of Terror. Uh, We got four short stories, Soothsayer, Splinter, Haunted, and Robot, and a wraparound story that connects them loosely together. And it's very much in the vein of a creep show, Twilight Zone, uh, Tales from the Crypt, that kind of a vibe to it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely got that vibe from it, especially uh, the Twilight Zone and stuff like that, just the way yeah. it's set up and the kind of twist endings. And uh, that, I really like that vibe for it. Do you prefer to make anthologies as opposed to regular feature films? Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I prefer necessarily. I think the enjoyable thing about doing anthologies is um, just the anticipation of the next story that you're working on. I mean, I always dedicate 100% focus on every film that we're making, but knowing that they're all part of a larger anthology and you get to tell all these different stories and work with all these different people, I think it really is, that's an exciting venture for me and um, definitely one that you know we, we pursued now for about, gosh, I guess about six years worth of filmmaking into two mm-hmm. anthologies. Jeez. When you're choosing which stories are going to go in each of these films, what are you looking for exactly? Well, I guess diversity in, in, in storyline and theme. You know, um, 
I like to do a sci-fi. I like to do a horror. I like to do dramatic. I like to do creature feature. I, and, and, you know, doing these stories, I always want to touch on things that I've always wanted to do. Um, in our first anthology, I got to do a story about dolls and a story about giant worms and a story about aliens and a story about werewolves. And th that was a lot of subject matter that I'd always wanted to, to touch on. And so in this sequel anthology, uh, time travel was something I wanted to pursue. I had written short stories by an author named uh, C.M. Eddie Jr. And um, he did some remarkable science fiction stories that really inspired me. And I actually read his book of short stories when I was in uh, Florida on vacation. And on the flight home, I pulled out my laptop and I wrote Soothsayer, the opening story for uh, this new anthology. And <clears throat> that was great because then we jump into Splinter, which is so much more of like a creature feature and has to do with ancient shaman curses and body transformation. And then we got to touch on Haunted, which was, a, it's a ghost story. And I've always wanted to do a ghost story. And um, of course we put our own kind of twist on the ghost story. And then um, we end that anthology with Robot, which is another sci-fi and, you know, um, kind of extraterrestrial visitor. So, uh, those are things that I really um, like in the genre, and and I t I use these as these anthologies as my opportunity to be able to get all that out of me, out of my system, and get to make all these different stories. Right. Speaking of some of those, like Splinter, for example, it had amazing makeup effects uh, in that one, and <laughs> throughout you. both films, actually, there's some really great makeup done. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the process behind that makeup and? You you seem to have a preference for practical effects versus CGI in your films. Is Without that a doubt, that's important to you. Yeah, it's it's really important to me. Um, the only times I do CGI is when I have to, mm -hmm. and um, you know, there's uh, without spoiling the film for the audience, there's a, there's a scene in Robot which I actually had to use some CGI uh, that was not intended originally. There were practical effects originally intended for that, but they weren't um, up to par. Uh, for what I was looking for. So, um, um, but in any case, the special effects, I have to give all credit to uh, Michael Scardillo, who handles um, like 90% of the practical effects that I do in films. Um, he's an awesome special effects artist. And for that project, I knew it was going to have such a, a big scope. And so I also brought on Beatrice Sniper, who handles the other 99% of my <laughs> effects. I know that doesn't add up, but it feels like these two are so deeply involved in, in so much of the stuff that I do. And um, the, I had them both on set together, um, her painting, applying, uh, and Mike designed the prosthetics for that short. Uh, he did an amazing job. We started with some sketches and artwork of kind of what I was looking for. Um, he would come back to me with some sculpts and some molds. We brought him over to the house. We'd have the, our lead actor come over. Uh, we'd kind of fit them and see, um, you know, if if it was getting the uh, desired effect. And uh, we spent months on it in pre-production, actually perfecting all that stuff and making all the specific things that we needed for that film to pull it off. But Mike did an incredible job and be interested in an incredible job. There, there are two people that I work with frequently, and um, you've seen their work and some of the other stuff that I've done as well. Yeah, yeah the really, really fantastic work from uh, both of them. So the theater itself plays a crucial role in the film, and it's a great location. Can you tell us about that location? Yeah, so uh, that is the Lafayette in Suffern, New York. Um, it is a one theater movie house. That That's the theater that we were in. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a beautiful place. We shot our original anthology in the landmark Lowe's in uh, Jersey City on Journal Square. And unfortunately, when we were in the midst of shooting this film, I reached out to them about uh, following up the wraparound story there. And they're closed for renovations until like 2025, mm -hmm. um, uh, which, which is great news for the theater because it's a beautiful landmark and they're going to really be putting state funds into it finally and investing in, in renovating the theater. Um, but it was unfortunate for our production because uh, we couldn't return to the same location. So right. I searched, you know, far and wide for a theater that could kind of duplicate that, you know, magnificent feel, that big, big feel and beautiful, like like an old classic theater. When when that thing was built, they probably were sold out. 
you know, mm-hmm. every yeah. every night. So um, you could see from the you know the volume that they can they can house in there. And so um, yeah, the Lafayette was our uh, our choice. Uh, it was a great place to shoot. I, I'm I'm sure you'll agree that it was beautiful, and I think it was comparable yeah. to the theater in the first film. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a great spot. Uh, is the theater experience something that was important to you growing up? And do you have any stories of kind of experiences that you had in a theater that kind of gave you the idea for these films? Yeah, um, I don't know that my, it was those experiences that gave me the ideas for these films. I think just films in general growing up gave me the ideas for these films. I was mm-hmm. I was influenced by a lot of stuff like The Twilight Zone and and watching the making of movies like Sinbad or or King Kong and and the stop motion and just learning a lot about the creative process for films. And I was kind of a creative kid. I used to draw comic books when I was younger. And so I was always kind of making up stories and things, situations that I'd want to be in. And and this kind of was the vehicle for that. Like films were where I could kind of find myself in, in that experience. And so, yeah. And, and growing up and going to the movies a lot as a kid, I think I had the same experience that most of us did where you had long lines for, really huge historically huge movies now you know whether it was Raiders of the Lost Ark or Empire Strikes Back or Mm -hmm. you know when Friday the 13th was released or you know I was going to the movies as a child and seeing these things and Jaws and everything and it was it was so amazing for me to be in a room packed with people and almost like a wave, we would all react right. exactly the same way to certain situations. It's, it's, it's this weird communal experience. Um, and it's, it's, there's so much energy there. And, you know, there's, I miss the experience of at the end of an amazing movie, the audience is just clapping <laughs> as if, as if there are people there that made right. the movie to receive it, but there's no one there. <laughs> They're just clapping at the screen, right? Right, right. And we're all sharing that moment. Like we all collectively enjoyed this. I think it's really extremely important to view movies that way, um, especially in this day and age when you know the attention span has has been shortened so mm-hmm. much with phones and there's so many things to distract you from sitting down and just committing to watching a film especially when we're home and you're streaming stuff and you could just pause it at any moment. I'll come back to this later. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. And so I really, I really um, kind of obsess over, I want my movie to be seen by many people together in a room and let's enjoy it. And, and, and you could hear the way that they um, react to particular scenes. And, and for a filmmaker, there's, there's nothing like that at all. Streaming doesn't give you that, benefit at all because you're not there to to experience that with them yeah absolutely and as someone who loves films and everything uh, are there any particular directors that uh, kind of influence your career and people that you think uh, are a good way to kind of learn how to make a film and stuff like that I mean I can go through the regular list of of, of wonderful directors over the past you know 30 40 years right that have inspired they they've they've inspired me as they've inspired most other filmmakers mm-hmm. writers have inspired me um artists have inspired me and when i say artists i mean sketch art or paintings um all of that has has really lent itself to my creative process um you know i think that spielberg is somebody that i always have to mention because i just think that this the size and the scope of his stories to me was always really what filmmaking is about um Mm -hmm. um sort of that take your breath away type stuff and and he's always been very impactful on on the stuff that I like to do in that sense but I mean I I have to give credit to everybody from Rod Serling you know to Stephen King to 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 Sam Raimi and all the I mean every like I said I could go through the normal list of Mm -hmm. guys that really did really cool stuff that just kind of inspired me um I just think the, the the collective of television and films and music and comic books uh are all set the, all the ingredients that went into the things i think about and i want to and i want to make right what is it about horror films specifically that makes you continuously want to make movies in this genre you know horror is fun and and horror allows you space to to do things that are dramatic to do things that are comedic and and then of course to do things that are scary and um, I, I like that. I, I think that 
we're losing that a little bit in the horror genre. I think it's starting to, to, to lean one way. And I think that we have to remember that there's so much great story storytelling that you could do with a horror film and not rely on the jump scares or the payoff, the gore and those, those scenes. Um, and that's just my personal opinion as someone that, you know, I, I enjoy the thriller and the suspense and the build of the story. And I think that horror gives us those opportunities um, to do things like that, um, where you have a film like, um, like like Jaws, which pe most people wouldn't consider a horror film because it it wasn't marketed that way when it came out, you right. know. Um, but um, I, I think there's a lot of room in horror to have a lot of fun with character building, and 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 um, appealing to uh, uh, the viewers' comedic sense, dramatic sense, and and of course the horror sense in them. And I think that that's what's fun about the genre where. You really like in a comedy, you have to be on point, you know, and, and make people laugh from beginning to end of that movie. You want to keep them there. Mm -hmm. Of course, you might have some romantic moments that are a little bit more dramatic, but everything is based around that comedic uh, character um, mm -hmm. and those character arcs. And I just feel like with horror, you can touch on a bunch of different stuff at different times in the film and hit all those right marks. And um, that's what's really drawn me. To, and that, and that's something that I really enjoyed about the genre growing up and watching as well. A lot of movies were very much like that. Right, absolutely. Something I personally like about the horror genre is that it's such a diverse genre, and in part because uh, there are more indie horror films than any other genre. Yeah. So as an indie f filmmaker, what advice would you give to someone who would like to start making indie films? Um, I It's the little things. Um we, I think a, a lot of us have stories that we want to tell um, and we have in our head, hopefully, as a filmmaker, you have the vision of what that's supposed to look like from beginning to end. Mm. Um, that, for me, is the easy part. The hard part are the little details. I think you need to build a team of people that you trust and that are competent. Um, you need to Think about everything that you want to do and how you're going to do it so you can eliminate as many mistakes as possible before you have to arrive on set or mm -hmm. at the location. I really think it's the devil is in those little details. And um, that's, a, that's another important step. So you build that team, you pay attention to the little details. And um, what I've always done as a filmmaker is... Um, I cast my films myself and uh, as much as we want to put our friends in our films and sometimes right. we have to, and sometimes sure. we have to. Um, but I think there's an honest process that you have to, you always have to be honest with yourself as a filmmaker. If you really want to get a really great result out of your work or the best result out of your work and out of your growth, you know, I, I could point at everything I regret in all my films. Right. It very easily. I could, I could address it and I probably, saw those things like the day after we were mm -hmm. done with it. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, um, I, I think if you can look at those things without letting them obviously affect your intent to, to do more creatively, you have to look at those mistakes. You have to grow from them. And a, as long as you could do all those things and stay humble, um, I think you'll have no problem making your films uh, and, and and if they're true to who you are, sharing those with people um, that will also enjoy them. But I think it's those little things, like I said, are very important. It's who you work with. It's how carefully you pay attention to your film and how you're creating it. And I'm talking about everything from how are we going to eat? Who's going to what time are we meeting? What do we need for the film? Who's handling the props? And my, does everybody have a script? Uh, uh, all those little details that are, you know, look, look, independent films, you usually don't have a huge crew with you helping right. you. A lot of things you handle personally. And so I just think it's important that if you're not taking care of those little details, you have someone that is and that you trust to take care of those little details because it changes everything about making a film. Uh, and, and the one thing that it changes significantly is people's desire to work with you, okay? Mm -hmm. If you are prepared, if you if they you look like you know what you're doing and you are prepared, people are gonna wanna work with you because it's very hard to find that. 
right. in independent film. Right. That's great advice uh, for sure. Um, going back to the film, is the Theater of Terror being set up as a long-running franchise, or are you looking maybe on doing something else uh, in the future? Yeah, I'm, right now we're kind of shifting gears into writing a, a feature film. Okay. Um, I don't want to really get into specifics about sure. uh, storylines or anything. Um, and, and, and look, we consider the anthology a feature film, but I just mean a standalone story mm -hmm. as a feature yeah, right. film. The, the anthology is such a great format. And, you know, if, if I had the stories written and, and the films cast already, I would probably just continue making more anthology films. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now that we're kind of done with this and all the work that went into it, I, 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 we do want to shift gears into something else and, um, and kind of take, take that step and maybe do a couple of micro shorts as well. Okay. Um, just to kind of keep sharp in between. But, um, I think that's going to be the next project on the horizon for us. Awesome. So when and where can people see uh, this movie? April 22nd. If you're listening and you're from Jersey. We're going to be screening at the Smod Castle Cinemas in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. Um, the show's probably going to start at 2 p.m. We haven't really nailed the time down. <laughs> it's either going to be 1 or 2 p.m. We want to start early so we have time afterwards to celebrate together. Um, tickets are going to be 10 bucks, and you can get them through the Smod Castle Cinemas website. Uh, we'll post all that information on www.theateroftterror.net where you can check out... Uh, you can get tickets there. Um, we'll direct you right to Smod Castle site. But yeah, we're looking forward to that screening. And we're trying to set up a few more screenings around Jersey and maybe a couple in New York as well. Very cool. And where can people follow you on social media uh, or a website where we can follow your career and see uh, kind of what you're doing uh, next? Well, Pete, I'd love for people to subscribe to our mailing list on, on theaterofterror.net. Um, you could find us on Twitter and Instagram at Theater Terror. No, uh, it's just Theater Terror. And Theater is spelled T-H-E-A-T-R-E. -E. Just want to make that clear. Um, and then on Facebook, you can find us as Theater of Terror. Perfect. Tom, it's an absolute pleasure. I can't wait for people to watch this film. I think there's a lot of great stuff in it. Uh, great makeup, great direction, great sets, uh, just with the theater and everything. And I think uh, our listeners are really going to dig it. So thank you very much for coming on the show. And you can pre-order the DVD on the website. And I hope people do because it's it's worth checking out. So thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.